Good morning. It's great to be back with you. Uh, I've been sadly on carer's duty uh, to give my parents a break for a short while, so I've not been around. It's good to be back with you all, whether you're with us here in the building or whether you're joining us on the live stream. We've already heard this morning quite a bit about how God is involved in every aspect of our lives. So before we dig in to hearing a little bit more about what can happen when we're living out God's plan for our lives, I just wanted to share a couple of quick words of testimony. So um, those of you who were on the prayer call will know that there was a meeting earlier this week that I was quite worried about at work. On the WhatsApp group, and I said, guys, I need some prayer for this. And Janet, who's not here this morning, sadly, uh, gave me this verse from Psalm 138. The Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. Your steadfast love, O Lord, endures forever. Do not forsake the work of your hands. So I started my working day on Thursday when I was expecting to join this meeting. And the meeting was in the afternoon. But in the morning, I'd been asked to join a different meeting, which was also quite an awkward one, as it happened. I didn't realize it would be. And then the meeting I'd been dreading, because the email saying, please come to this meeting, read like a court summons. Unfortunately, it was actually really positive, and I was able to provide the information that had been asked for in a quite a positive way, and it's, it's sounding hopeful that actually we will be able to move forward. That's a real answer to prayer, and I just wanted to share that with you quickly. We serve a Lord, a God who answers prayer. And throughout the Bible, we are assured of God's perfect plan for our lives. Steve mentioned Jeremiah 29.11 earlier, which reads, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. A promise which is repeated by Paul in his letter to the church in Rome, Romans 8 and verse 28. For we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those called according to his purpose. Now, as we've heard mentioned a few times, in our modern culture, everything is expected quickly. We've got so used to next day delivery and on-demand television and all of the other distractions of life that this can detract from actually spending enough time with God. We perhaps make the mistake of dwelling too much on the ongoing battle with a particular sin or a particular bad habit we can't seem to step away from. And we maybe don't notice that keeping up with the barrage of new content on our favorite streaming service or our favorite social media platform is in fact swallowing up time at a quite a large rate. A while back, Stephen encouraged us to press pause on the modern world in order to spend more time with God. Now, as hearing the Lord's voice can be a struggle, if you're anything like me, and I really struggle to sit in silence and just wait on God. So what I wanted to do this morning is to remind us that there are great blessings promised when we are living out God's plan for our lives, but also that there are some disciplines and some practical things that we can be doing in order to do just that. It might sound countercultural, but please be assured I'm speaking to myself as well as you guys here. As we're instructed in the scriptures, fear not, the Lord has promised to be with us wherever we go and whatever we do. Wherever we happen to be on the race that has been marked out for us, as Paul mentions in his letters. You might be running in the lead, several seconds clear of the rest of the pack. Or you might be in the pits, needing to refuel and get a fresh set of tyres. Thankfully for us, we're not in a Hollywood movie. 
There's no Yoda telling us, do or do not, there is no try. Many theologians make the point that the scriptures are buzzing with the promises of God. They make it because it's true. And we have the benefit of being able to look back and see how many of those promises in the Old and the New Testaments have been fulfilled. Or in other words, we can look back and see the highs and lows of living out God's plan for our lives. Abraham and Sarai are granted a child, despite both being well advanced in years, and Sarai, later called Sarah, being suspected of being barren. Later on, Jacob's family, and later known as the Israelites, are protected and blessed by God in a quite amazing way. Not, able other, not only are they able to take refuge from famine in Egypt, where they continue to be blessed and continue to prosper for approximately 200 years. Yes. Now, I did some quick Googling, because I love history, and roughly 30 pharaohs of Egypt ruled during that time. Now, my research was far from exhaustive, so I could have got that wrong, and even people who study Egypt for a living, who are called Egyptologists, are among the first to say that there's an awful lot about ancient Egypt that we still don't know. Later on, we of course see the exodus from Egypt. The pharaohs have turned against the Israelites and Moses leads them away. We see the splitting of the Red Sea. They're able to walk away across the seabed. But that's not the end of the story. Despite the Israelites' grumblings, we see water pouring from rocks in the desert on demand for them to drink and manna and quail being provided for food as they travel towards the promised land. When Israel becomes the Jewish nation of Israel, it still has its peaks and troughs. We have wonderful, glorious moments under the judges, and then we have the people demanding a king. Saul starts off with the best intentions, and then it all goes a bit wrong. David, while he's described as a man after God's own heart, he still has moments as king where he gets things quite badly wrong. We culminate with Solomon, and he starts off brilliantly. It's the year of the Lord's favor. They've finished building the temple. Everything seems to be going well. That goes south too. And then we see people like Hannah, an ordinary woman who's been praying for a son for many years. And when that prayer is answered, she's true to her word. She returns Samuel to the Lord. He trains as a priest under Eli. He's one of the judges of Israel. So what disciplines do we need to use? Use in order to spend more time with God. Well, if you're hoping for some nice new earth-shattering revelation here, I'm afraid I must disappoint you, because the truth is quite simple. It's spending time in prayer, spending time in our Bibles, worshipping and fellowshipping, fellowshipping sorry, with other believers. Now, for many of us, our preference is in person, but if you've not seen someone for a while, then there's nothing stopping you from writing an email, picking up the phone, or sending them a text. Again, I'm not having a go. I need to get better at that myself. How then do we go about carving out more time? Well, sometimes, it, maybe if you struggle to read, or if you find it difficult to read your Bible, there are other ways of spending time in the Word. You might, for example, find it easier to use an audio Bible. There are quite a few of these around. I've tried two of them. I got on an awful lot better with one than with the other. My personal favourite uh, is a reading of the NIV by David Suchet, which you can get hold of on Audible uh, and is also available on CD. You can also use memory verses 
as passwords. So you get to reflect on some of your favorite promises in scripture as you answer your emails, order your groceries, or complete any other number of other tasks that we do online these days. Now, speaking of somebody who works in IT, I can assure you that if you include the verse reference, your password will still be a reasonably strong one. When I was commuting daily into the office, before working from home became as big as it is, I found that listening to worship music or sermons I'd missed on my way to work was a good way of spending additional time with God. There are also study plans that you can get on your phone, or download to read or listen to. The one I've used most recently and found very helpful is provided by Nikki and Pippa Gumbel, who lead London's HTB, the home of the Alpha course. The program is called Bible in One Year and is available for Android, iOS, and from their website, BibleInOneYear.org. Now if you're inclined to fidget like me, sometimes it can be helpful to find something that when you're doing a particular activity, you're able to reflect on God. So if you, pr if you play an instrument, it might be practicing and playing some worship songs. I've also found that if I listen to some worship music or an audio Bible while I'm doing some model making, that helps me to focus spend more time on God, something about I'm creating something whilst focusing on the creator God. You might find other activities suit you better, perhaps you prefer to paint or draw, do cross stitch, make lace, or perhaps you're someone who's moved to worship as you walk in beautiful places and we're so fortunate here that we have some wonderful places close by. Probably nearest to the church building is the walk along the Oxford Canal, along the old towpath. But there's also the reservoir up at the top of the hill, and the grounds of Blenheim Palace are beautiful. That's not far off either. A little further out, I live in Vista. Places like Bure Park and Stoke Wood are very pretty, and popular places for walking the dogs when I have the family with me. As we are all different, we experience the presence of God and reflect on all he has done for us in very different ways. We all have different giftings to serve our church family and reach out with the gospel to our neighbours, friends and colleagues. In the well-known film, Chariots of Fire, we see the story of two athletes of faith competing in the 1924 Olympics. One of them, Eric Liddell, was a runner. He's famous for saying that he felt closest to God while running. During the 1924 games, he refused to compete in his preferred event, the 100 meters, due to the heats being run on Sundays. He ran instead in the 400 meters and won the event. What I didn't know prior to preparing for this is that after his win in the 400 meters, he returned to work on the mission field in China. Sadly, he was taken prisoner by the Japanese and died in 1945 in one of their prison camps at the age of around 40. When we read the Psalms, we see what many people describe as a soundtrack of worship and prayer for all aspects of our lives. Now I know because it was mentioned on the prayer meeting on Wednesday that for some people Psalm 19 is very helpful. For me personally I've always found that at times where I'm low, where I'm struggling with sin or breaking bad habits, wanting to get up out of the ditch and back onto a high, that Psalm 51 Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin, 
For I know my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Against you, and you only, have I sinned, and done what is evil in your sight, so that you may be justified in your words, and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret part. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you've broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins, and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and uphold me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will return to you. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, O God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise, for you will not delight in sacrifice, or I would give it. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. Do good to Zion in your good pleasure. Build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will delight in right sacrifices, in burnt offerings and whole burnt offerings, and bulls will be offered on your altar. Now, Psalm 51, which I just read, is particularly helpful when we stop and consider the context. So this is a psalm written by David after one of his biggest and probably best known mistakes. Yes, I'm talking about Bathsheba. So rather than going away with his forces to fight Israel's enemies, David stays at home. He catches sight of a woman called Bathsheba, who is the wife of one of his officers, Uriah the Hittite. He invites her to the palace and has an affair with her. When he then finds out that Bathsheba is pregnant, he sets about covering his tracks. So first off, he calls Uriah home from the front in the hope that he will spend time with his wife and think that the baby is his. Well, that doesn't work because Uriah decides that he can't possibly go and sleep with his wife while all his compatriots are sleeping in tents on the battlefield and instead sleeps in the palace courtyard. Then he tries getting Uriah drunk. Uh, that doesn't work either. He passes out in the palace somewhere. And finally, he resorts to probably the worst thing he does. He betrays Uriah. He sends him back to the front. He orders the general to send him into the fiercest part of the fighting and then have the other troops withdraw. The result... Uriah's death at the hand of Israel's enemies. We are all human, and because we all have weaknesses, like those shown by David in that story, and all suffer as a result of original sin, no one is perfect. But thankfully, we are promised in 1 John 1 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we look back, I'm sure there are a huge number of people we could draw on here who put their faith first to serve others, whether that's in military service, as medics, police, fire service personnel. We have only to look back, perhaps, at things like Her Majesty's Birthday Honours List, or the large number of different groups who took part in the Platinum Jubilee pageant to see just how broad this range of people can be. And that's just Britain and the Commonwealth. What's most important is that our faith should lead us to action. The areas where we are able to act will be different depending on our abilities and our giftings. So maybe you feel able to volunteer for Jesus Fields, 
or you'd prefer to just come along and see what happens. Maybe you don't feel you can do anything more than pray. But whatever you can do, I'd encourage you to be doing it. Personally, I'm praying for the event and I'm planning to attend. I know many of you are volunteering. And let's look forward to seeing what God does. So why is this important? Well, we're taught in James 2 that faith without works is dead. Bear with me a moment while I find it. Having written down the page number, I've managed to turn past it three times. Okay, so it's James 2, um, verse 14. What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled, without giving them the things they need for the body, what good is that? So also, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one. You do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. Do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? You see that faith was active along with his works, and faith was completed by his works. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. And he was called a friend of God. You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. And in the same way was not also Rahab justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way. For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. Rahab being the prostitute who sheltered the Israelite spies at Jericho. At the moment, we are starting to see more headlines around the rising cost of living and the fact that this is now beginning to cause some difficulties for food banks and that they're struggling to meet demand. I have to confess, I had wrongly assumed, as is not uncommon, that the situation was simply being exaggerated to the press. However, when I was staying at my parents recently caring for my grandmother, I nipped into their village, Chapleton Giles, to run some errands, and I was quite shocked to see a queue outside a porter cabin bearing the name Chapleton Giles Community Fridge, which I can only assume is a food bank. Now, my parents, as I've just mentioned, live in Chapleton Giles. This is in South Bucks in the London commuter belt. It's an area that's known for being wealthy. So a queue outside a food bank came as something of a shock. We are not called to a sedentary faith, as we just heard in James. We're called to act on our giftings. The whole body of the church, with all its different gifts, all the different gifts that God has given to you, Kay, to you, Constance, to you, Stephen, to you, Sujay, and to anyone watching at home, are intended to come together as one cohesive whole unit in order to serve our family, friends, community, and to reach out and lift up with the gospel. 
For this, we need to be practicing those spiritual disciplines so we're in a place to answer that call when it comes. And however it comes. It could be something as simple as a colleague saying, how are you getting on with this? And you being in a position to say, actually, I'm doing really well and I can only put that down to answer prayer. Or it could be something far deeper. Whether your gifting is for prayer, worship, theology, mission, hospitality, befriending and discipleship, or any number of other things that I may have missed off that list, everyone has their part to play. So, as I draw to a close this morning, my prayer for us all is that we would be equipped to set aside that time to spend with God. That we would be granted ears to hear his voice while we seek to serve him as a church and as individuals as we seek to confer, as we seek to fulfill his great commission to make disciples of all nations. And as I'm sure Stephen would say if he's up here, notice disciples, not converts. That's everything from me this morning. I hope that's helpful to you. Cheers, Phil. Thank you. Yeah, awesome word. I mean, I didn't hear all of it because we had um, uh, an alcoholic who came in in the back there, and um, it was great just getting to minister to, to him outside. And and yeah, and, and, and I mean, as I, as I'm walking back in through the doors, I'm hearing uh, Phil, uh, you know, give that scripture from Psalm 51 about teaching sinners, in the, you know, in the way that they should go. And you know, as as David uh, is, is is told by God when David repents, you know, and I. I just think that's amazing how, uh, you know, God will take me from being an alcoholic and then use me to remit to an alcoholic outside. So uh, we praise God, don't we, for his, for his providence and for his glory. But you know what, one thing, yeah, I think that's a fantastic word that you've brought there. Uh, really, really interesting about how we are justified by faith only, but by works. Or well, is that actually what the scripture's saying? You know, because if it is, then that means that James is contradicting Paul, right? And that would mean that James is also contradicting the book of Hebrews that we've just read this morning. You know, the one who, the one who enters into a Sabbath rest ceases from works. Now, what James is saying here, and I think, you know, you, you, you were in this, this already, you know, Paul says in Romans 3 that a man is justified by, not by works of the law, but a man is justified by faith alone, apart from the works of the law. That's, that's what he quote the Apostle Paul there, right? James says, a man is not justified by faith alone, but by, by, but by justified by his works. Well, they're both contradicting? Well, well, no, that's what liberal theology would say. We think the Bible is infallible, inerrant, you know, it's consistent. These teachers are teaching the same thing. What James is teaching is, you know, faith without works is death. We're justified by faith alone, amen. That your works don't, don't make you right before God. The finished work of Christ makes you right. The shed blood at Calvary makes you right with Jesus Christ, makes you right with God. He took the wrath of God in your place so you could be a son and daughter, amen. Hallelujah, glory to God. Not because of your works. But then James is saying, well, if, you, if, if, if that faith doesn't lead to transformation, then I'd question whether you really do have saving faith. Because saving faith leads to change. You know, the reformers used to say, we're justified by faith alone, but saving faith is never alone. It always leads to transformation, it bears fruit. So yeah, great word there. We enter into the Sabbath rest of God. And when we're talking about resting and ceasing from work, as we did in that prophetic word, lovely how it's all come together, isn't it? It's not saying don't work at all. It's saying work from that place of rest, from that abiding, from that waiting on God, from that dwelling in his presence and in his spirit. And as you do that, you won't burn out. You won't fatigue. You'll have peace, you'll have joy, you'll have energy. You'll be moving in the energy of God, in the Holy Spirit. And it'll be him who's in control and in the driving seat. Do you know what we're doing that? It's important because here it stops us from burning out. It's God working through us, amen. Work out your salvation and fear and trembling because it's God who works in you to will and to do his good pleasure. 
Amen. Philippians 2, 12 to 13. It's important for that. But it's also important because then we won't be doing things for the wrong reasons. For the wrong motives. I just want to add to your message today, Phil. And just combine that prophetic word with your sermon. And just say, what are your motives? Why are you doing the things that you're doing? It's a question we all need to constantly ask ourselves. Examine our hearts. Why do you serve in church? Why are you serving at Jesus Fields? Why do you do the things that you do? Do you do it because you're serving God and God alone? Or is there something mixed in there? You, you know, you, you want a bit of affirmation off of people. You want to feel a bit of self-worth. Do you know what I mean? You want to feel a bit important. Maybe there's something in you where you feel like, man, I don't feel like I'm doing enough for God. I, I need to do something for God. Amen? It's very, very normal to feel like that, but I'm telling you, like, it's not right to feel like that. We need to be serving God because we're serving God. Not because we're trying to please people, not because we're looking for affirmation of people, not because we want to feel self-worth even. All those things should come through God, not through what we do. And so I think that's a really, really important thing for us to think about. And you know what, as a, as a pastor, I, I, I have to examine myself against this stuff. There's things that I do sometimes where I think, when I look back on it, I think, yeah, I didn't really do that. And they're like, did that come from pure faith or did that come from me trying to, you know, get myself ahead of the game? You know, when I go to conferences, you know, I'm trying to network with everybody, I'm trying to like, meet people. Who, 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 he'd be good to go and get a preacher at our church. Is that trusting in the sovereignty of God or is that me trying to, you know, look, none of us, none of us are, you know, none of us are all sorted, we've not all got it together. We're all a work in progress. We're all saints who sin. Yeah? And we all need to kind of look at our hearts and, 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 and look why do we do some of the things we do. Remembering that all of our worth, our security, our dignity, our affirmation, our sense of feeling loved, our sense of belonging, our sense of acceptance, all of it comes through the sonship and daughtership that is ours in Jesus Christ. When Christ, 2,000 years ago, was battered, beaten by, by sinful men. And he was scorned and he was brought back to that crowd of the Pharisees under Pontius Pilate in the court. And they said, crucify him, crucify him. Let his blood be upon us and upon our children. And so Jesus is led away to the slaughter and the Pontius Pilate, who hung on a tree and he's crucified, he hangs there for hours. And he mentors a moment where he is alienated and estranged from God. Well, at least he experiences that. I mean, God's omnipotent. It's impossible for God not to be present anywhere. He experiences what it's like to be estranged from God. He experiences separation from God. So that you find people this morning that know what it is to be reconciled to God. He died for our sin. The Bible says that he entered into the lower parts of the earth. And on the third day, he rose again victorious, conquering sin, conquering death, conquering the grave. He appeared to all the disciples and to more than 500 eyewitnesses, the Bible says. And then he ascended after 40 days to the right hand of God, where he is ruling now, even to this day, at the right hand of the Father. And he's instead of his kingdom throughout all the history of the world. The beauty of this is that if we will just give up and let go, fall to our knees and say, God, I'm finished to make myself good. I'm finished trying to make something in my life. I'm finished with striving. I'm finished with trying hard. I'm holding on to self-effort and drive. But today, God, I just let go. And we will do that. We will find that Sabbath rest. We will find that desire that we want to serve God in the highs and the lows We'll find that we want to go to Jesus' fields and we're just excited about it because our hearts and our motives are right. 
people have that horrible feeling of you know having to try and you know compete against others and all this sort of stuff because uh, you know I couldn't get myself to feel content, to feel accepted. But it might still be best teachers. It's still be still to the right guys who can experience it right now today. And I want to say that God wants us to experience it more and more and more and more as our walk and relationship with him develops.